Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. Now one of the jumper blocks on your motherboard that's most challenging is what we call the front panel header. Now some motherboards call this series of pins that connect your power on, your reset, your hard drive activity light, and your system power light to the motherboard. They may call that different. So they may use a different set of terms. But basically it's a set of pins from your motherboard that allows you, in this case, this is my reset button and it allows me to put a jumper block. These wires go back to this, this particular momentary push button. And if you'll notice, your reset and power on button are known as momentary. In other words, these buttons are spring loaded. So you make contact and the spring pushes that connection back off. So it shorts and then it opens again. That's a momentary switch. It's wise to make sure that you read your motherboard diagram so that you know how to properly put these jumpers on the jumper block. Let's start first with our USB 2.0 jumper block. And notice we have five pins on one row. We have four pins on the other. We have a missing pin here in the corner. We have another 2.0 jumper block and again, a missing pin. This allows the manufacturer of the plug that goes here to create what's known as a key to plug. So they can fill this hole here in the corner and you cannot plug in the plug on the jumper pins incorrectly. It prevents damaging the USB circuit board on the case and it prevents damaging the circuits here on the motherboard. You'll notice that's done over here in the TPM. We have a missing pin. So the plug that goes on these jumper pins can be keyed so you can put it in correctly each time. Notice COM. We see the COM also has a missing pin. Also the audio jumpers have a missing pin. And again, that is to allow the manufacturer of the plug to create a keyed plug. Now this is a classic enterprise desktop and you can see it's about as unexciting as any hardware that you've ever looked at. But it's designed for ease of repair and simplicity and meeting the needs of the business. So if you look down here, you can see my USB 2.0 jumper block. Now here is the plastic plug that fits on the jumper block. And notice they deliberately filled in an area of that plug so that it would fit where the missing pin is. In other words, they keyed the plug. It only goes in one way. This prevents technicians and users from plugging in their plugs to the jumper block incorrectly. On the desktops, USB 3.0 and above. Remember, we have many versions at the three-point level. We have 3.1, 3.2, generation one and two. This is still a very popular USB connector. Notice that they use a plastic border, uh, like a fence around the pins. Again, this is to try to prevent people from bending the pins as they insert the plug in. It has a missing pin here, again, to key. They cut away the fence or this black border, so again, you typically put a plug in here and it will have a protruding piece of plastic that will fit in there. Again, to prevent bending of pins and keying this plug. Another set of plugs that's very important to understand proper procedures is the power plug. This is a 24 pin plug that fits into this carefully crafted set of another plug on the motherboard. This is specially designed plastic so that this plug going in here creates a great deal of friction. So it's hard to insert and it's hard to remove. It's very important that you insert it completely in. This plug is keyed so you can't put it in correctly. This is my release lever on here and it goes and catches to the edge of this plug here. When you insert this, I always start from one side and kind of tilt it and bring it down. Always support 
underneath the board. Because it's friction and it has to make solid contact, support that board underneath with your fingers so you don't flex the board. Now, when you remove this plug, it can be really challenging, especially when this has been sitting for two years. So when I do this, I typically will take and I will release the latch and I will rock the plug back and forth. So I will release the plug and gently rock this gently out until it comes out. Always rock it back and forth gently until you get that plug out of the socket. This is true also of our CPU power jack as well as the PCI Express power connectors on our graphics card. There are two procedures done by technicians on motherboards that result in the most catastrophic failures. One is the improper installation of RAM. They don't either seat it correctly or they leave it slightly cocked out of the dim socket and they think they've got it set up. When it comes to the CPU, if you bend the pins on the land grid array on the motherboard or you bend the pins on the CPU, depending on the CPU, and you insert it in the socket and you energize it, you're going to destroy the CPU and you're probably going to destroy the motherboard. Either of those will end in a catastrophic failure once you apply power. Now here is my platform controller hub. We used to call this Southbridge, but Intel has changed that nomenclature to platform controller hub. This basically is the main circuit that runs everything but memory, graphics, and CPU. So really the rest of the motherboard is managed by this one chip. This is one of the most important chips on your motherboard. Notice the size of the heatsink. Pay attention to that. Different platform controller hubs will have larger or smaller heat sinks. It gives you a sense of how much heat is required or dissipated by that chip. Another interesting component that you have on your motherboard is this component right here. This is known as a crystal and it's responsible for generating very, very highly accurate clock signals. Because it's a motherboard based on digital systems, clocking is very important. So this guy right here is responsible for clocking. Make sure that you locate your firmware chip. This is where my UEFI my bias is stored. This is actually a chip that holds software. Let's talk about some terms that are often seen in documentation that are incorrect. One, often you will see documentation talking about this battery as a CMOS battery. That is not correct. It is simply a lithium cell that is used to maintain our real-time clock in our platform controller hub. Always be careful and in fact avoid removing this lithium battery unless you absolutely have to do it. If you break these tabs when you're trying to extract the battery, Battery, and sometimes they're a pain to get out. If you break these tabs that hold it in place firmly, you've basically lost a motherboard. Only remove this battery when you absolutely have to do that. This chip here actually contains software in it, and it is known as a firmware chip. Basically, this one here stores about eight megabytes of software. If you have an older motherboard, it will contain the BIOS, the old style BIOS firmware that boots and initializes the motherboard and tries to find an operating system to load. If you have a newer motherboard, you'll have UEFI that's burned into this chip, but this is known as firmware. Now this chip is very special in that we can actually overwrite the software inside the chip. When we flash our firmware, we basically tell the circuit board to raise the voltage on one pin. When that voltage is raised on this chip, it puts this chip into a special mode in which it allows software to write over the top of what's existing there. This is when we flash our firmware. As you think about UEFI as your firmware that initializes your motherboard, think of it as a miniature operating system because that's what it really is. PCI x 16 connectors. They have a locking tab that 
raises up and locks into the card that you place in here. When you want to take a PCI Time 16 card out, you have to bring this tab down, you unlock it, and then you can raise the card out. Be sure to do that. I've seen guys almost tear a motherboard out because they forgot about these locking tabs for Time 16 cards. Also, when you plug a card in this, this PCI Express slot, make sure if you see any copper visibly as you insert the adapter into this card, Make sure that you don't see any copper traces. It should be firmly inserted down to where it's seated firmly because if you don't and power on and the card is not properly seated, you could damage the card and the motherboard. Pay attention to your specs. Many times you'll have a PCI Time 16 connector on the motherboard, but when you look at your motherboard specifications, it's actually a Times 8. So it is cheaper to put a Time 16 connector on the motherboard than a Times 8. So a lot of times you'll see a long connector, but only half of the pins are connected. So pay attention to that. You're thinking you got a times 16 when in reality you've got a times 8. If you'll notice this PCI 16 connector is just black plastic. If you'll notice the one behind it that I have here where I've got the graphics card in, it's got a metal shielding all the way around it. The reason they put the metal around this particular PCI Express connector is that it one provides RFI EMI shielding because of the high speed digital traffic coming in and out of this graphic card into the motherboard. It helps prevent some of that RFI EMI emissions from getting into the rest of the motherboard. Board. It also provides a little stiffener to the plastic connector, makes it a little bit more rugged. So on this particular motherboard, I have a TPM header. These pins will allow me to take a TPM card and plug it right into these pins. Anytime you take a circuit board and you plug into a motherboard, that circuit board is called a daughter card. So anytime I plug another printed circuit board into the motherboard, like I would here for this TPM module, that board is called a daughter card. Now this is a very popular way of bringing Wi-Fi. This is a Wi-Fi, Intel Wi-Fi 6 module. It plugs into a M.2 connector and it screws down just like a M.2 device. This module contains a RFI EMI shielded can that sits on top of the circuit board and under the metal can is all the transmitter receiver power amplifiers for this Wi-Fi 6 device. We connect two tiny coax cables right here. These two gold contacts are actually coax cables and the cables go out to the antenna. So these tiny coax cables come out. Basically you have some jacks here and they connect right up to the base of the antenna. These jacks would go into a expansion slot cover and a series of holes and you would thread them through and lock nut them in place and then hook up your antennas to the outside. Here because mine is all open I just leave the antennas flopping. This particular motherboard supports the M.2 PCI Express solid state hard drives. The thing you want to be careful about is pay attention to the temperature of your hard drives. Depending on how much you're exercising your hard drives, the temperature on these hard drives can exceed the manufacturer's recommended temperature and they're designed to automatically lock down. So it's wise to know this is a Western Digital Blue. Look up the specs, find out what your temperature range is, and monitor your temperature of your solid state hard drive. You can use a number of software tools that will monitor all your temperature sensors. Make sure you're not exceeding those temperatures. Otherwise, this system will automatically clock down and actually slow your operating system down. They make a motherboard. One of the last things they do is they paint on what is known as silkscreen. Basically, silkscreen is painted information about components, connectors, plugs, the motherboard model. All of that is painted on. In this case, they used a white paint and it gives you tremendous information about this motherboard. What components are resistors? What components are capacitors? Which slot is a PCI Express times 16, which is a PCI Express times one. So that information is put on by silkscreen and you can read it and by taking a few moments to read the information on the motherboard you can gain a great deal of insight as to what's on the motherboard.
for all of the IT pros, IT students, make sure you know what the appropriate nomenclature and terminology for all your input output connectors. You should know this is a high density DB15 VGA out. You should know this is a DVID, USB-C, USB 3.0. Know the proper terminology, know the different colors that are associated with different generations and different speeds of USB. Please do not go into an interview and tell your interviewee that this is a whatchamacallit and this is a thingamajig. Make sure you know the different kinds of colors, what blue is for audio, what green is for audio, pink is for mic. If you don't know that, please learn it. Don't expect users to know jacks and plugs and connectors, but we do expect IT pros know their technology. Now, when it comes to your CPU, be very careful about inserting it into the socket. Today's CPUs are keyed. You can't put them in incorrectly, but by putting them in, those land grid array pins are very delicate and you can bend them and it's really, really hard to find the bent pin and many times it's almost impossible to fix it. The CPU surface has many, many, many hundreds of contacts. And even though they're gold plated, if you touch them with your finger, you can put oil on that surface and really deteriorate the surface from contact. Remember the voltages at those contacts are extremely low. If someone does touch the surface, the contact surface of your CPU, take 100% or 99% isopropanol alcohol and clean the contact surface before you install. When it comes to thermal grease and how much you put on your heat sink as you apply it to your CPU surface, notice this is a pre-designed heat sink from Intel. There's very little thermal grease here. You don't need a lot, you just need enough to have a thin layer between the surface of the heatsink and the surface of the CPU. If you're going to apply thermal paste yourself, just put about a pea size in the center of the CPU surface, and then you can either use a credit card or your finger to spread it evenly across the area of the top of the CPU. This is the heat sink that I put on my AMD CPU on my video editor, and you can see it's not a lot of thermal grease just enough adequately to cover the surface of the CPU. This is a great illustration showing you the movement of heat. We've got our heat sink that's sitting on top of the CPU and it literally pulls the heat off of the CPU surface, moves it up through the mass of the heat sink, through the various coils up into the air. It's amazing how effective these heat sinks pull and move heat. Anytime you're dealing with static sensitive devices, make sure you leave them in the static bag or on top of the static bag if you're about ready to work with it. Don't get careless with static electricity.